Chapter 7 of 2,000 Miles Below by Charles Willard Diffin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ring Smitty, Rawson had called him, when he found the youngster fighting gamely with death in the heat of Tana Basin. And Gordon Smith was the name on the company records. Yet he remained always Smitty to Rawson, and the name which Rawson never ceased to believe was assumed became a mark of the affection which can spring up between man and man. And now Smitty stood like a rigid carved statue in the midst of a barren sandy waste in the vast cup of a towering volcano top, sand that was in reality coarse pumice and ash. This was a place of death, a place where raging fires had left nothing for plant or animal life. And, over all, the desert stars shone down coldly and added to the desolation with their own pale light. Smitty had seen Rawson pull himself to the top of the great square-edged rock. Sensing that danger of some sort was threatening, he had started to run to the aid of the struggling man. Then came Rawson's cry. "'Back!' he shouted. "'Get back, Smitty. I'm coming!' But he did not come, and Smitty, halted by the command, was frozen to sudden, panic-stricken immobility by that which followed. He saw the leaping things, like grotesque yellow giants. They came from the sand. Then red ones leaped from the open throat, which had suddenly formed. They held flamethrowers, the red ones, and the green lines of fire melted the rock from beneath Rawson's feet. All in the one second's time it was done, and Rawson's body, his arms wide-flung, was hurtling downward into the waiting throat and the threatening red glow from within. Then the carriers of flamethrowers vanished again into the pit, and there was left only a huddle of giant figures that tore at the loose sand and ash with their hands. They threw the material in a continuous stream. The air was full of cascading sand. To Smitty, they were suddenly inhuman. They were almost animals, men like moles and they and their companions had captured Dean Rawson, sent him to his death. Slowly, the watching man raised himself from the crouched position that had kept him hidden. They were through with their work, these great yellow-skinned naked men, or mole men. Six of them. Smitty counted them slowly before he took aim, and two were armed with flamethrowers. Smitty rested his arm across the little hummock of gritty ash that had sheltered him and sent six flashes of flame through the night toward the cluster of bodies. He made no attempt to aim at each individual. The shapes were too shadowy for that, and he had no knowledge of what other weapons they might have. One thing was sure, he must take no chances on facing the Red Ones single-handed. He rammed his empty pistol back into its holster as he turned and ran ran with every ounce of energy he possessed to drive his flying feet across the crater floor, out through the cleft in the rocks and down the steep mountainside. He was stunned by the suddenness of the catastrophe that had overtaken them. The horror of Dean Rawson's going, the fearful reality of those devils from hell that old Riley had seen. It was all too staggering, too numbing for easy acceptance. Time was required for the truth to sink in, and, through the balance of the night, Smitty had plenty of time to think. He dared not go back to the camp, where ripping flashes of green light told him the enemy was at work, and then, even had it been possible to creep up on them in the darkness, that one chance vanished as the desert about the camp sprang into view. One after another, the buildings burst into flame, and Smitty was thankful for the concealment of the vast, empty desert. The embers were still glowing when he dared go near. This enemy, it seemed, worked only at night, and Smitty waited only for the sun to show above distant purple ranges. It had been their enemy once, that fiercely hot sun, they had fought against the heat, but never had the sun wrought such destruction as this. Smitty looked from haggard, hopeless eyes upon the wreckage of Rawson's camp. For the men who had worked there, this had meant only a job. To Smitty, it had been a fight against the desert which had defeated him once. But to Rawson, 
It meant the fruit of years of effort, the goal of his dreams brought almost within reach. Smitty looked at the smoldering heaps of gray, where an idle wind puffed playfully at fluffy ash or fanned a bed of coals to flame. Twisted steel of the wrecked derrick was still further distorted. The enemy had ripped it to pieces with his stabbing flames. Even the unused materials, the steel and cement that had been neatly stacked for future use, the flames had been turned on it all. And Smitty, though his voice broke almost boyishly from his repressed emotion, spoke aloud in solemn promise. "'It's too late to help you, Dean. I'll go back to town, report to the men who were back of you, and then they're going to pay, Dean. Whoever, whatever they are, they're going to pay.' He turned toward the mountains and the ribbon of road that wound off toward the canyon. Then, at some recollection, he swung back. The cable's still down. He would have wanted it left all shipshape, he whispered. Where the derrick had stood was the mouth of the twenty-inch casing. The cable that ran from it was entangled with the wreckage of the derrick, but it had not been cut. Smitty set doggedly to work. A little gin pole and light tackle allowed him to erect a heavier tripod of steel beams. It hoisted the big sheave block into place, and gave Smitty's two hands the strength of twenty to rig a temporary hoist. The juice was still on the main feed line, and the hoisting motors hummed at his touch. The ten miles of cable wound slowly onto the drums. "'It's nonsense, I suppose,' he told himself silently, but something drove him to do this last thing to leave it all as Rawson would have left it. The long baler came out at last. There was just room to hoist it clear and let it drop back on the drilling floor. A glint of gold flashed in the sunlight as Smitty let the long metal tube down, and he broke into voluble cursing at the sight of the bit of metal that was caught near the baler's top. The gold had started it all. The first finding of the gold on the big drill had begun it. He crossed swiftly to the gleaming thing that seemed somehow to symbolize his loss. He stooped to reach for it, intending to throw it as far as he could. Instead, he stood in an awkward, stooping attitude, stood so while the long, uncounted minutes passed. His eyes that stared and stared in disbelief seemed suddenly to have turned traitor. They were telling him that they saw a ring a cameo, jammed solidly into the shackle at the baler's end. And that ring, when last he had seen it, had been on Dean Rawson's hand. Dean had caught it. He had hooked it over the lever in this very place. And now, from ten miles down inside the solid earth, it had returned. It meant, it meant. But the stocky, broad-shoulder youngster, known as Smitty, dared not think what it meant nor had he had time to follow the thought. He was too busily engaged in running at suicidal speed across the hot sand toward barren mountains where a ribbon of road showed through the quivering air. End of chapter 7